Hi, and welcome to our new Women in Safety morning show. We've got a great show lined up for you today. I've got a special treat. I've got Donna Cleeton with us, and she's going to kick off a new series that she's going to talk to you about in a minute. Hey, Donna, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. It'd be great if you share with our listeners what you've got in store for us. Yeah, so the overall theme for this is the emotional safety of women at work. And if we think about organisational safety culture being the product of the individual, the group values, the attitudes, the perceptions and competences and behaviours, we really need to stop and think that in the 21st century world of work, we've got more women in the workforce, yet the safety data, the safety laws, the stereotypes are still based on that default male. And personally, I think this impacts the emotional safety of women at work. So the, the point of these podcasts is to raise the awareness and the diversity at work and how this impacts women, specifically focusing on some things like the mental load and the unpaid shift, the stress experience and coping, organisational trust and belonging and the lack of differentiated safety data. And we really want to kick off this first one talking about the mental load and the unpaid shift and the impact this has on women at work. So uh, Donna, you had... Um... You were going to talk about mental load and unpaid shift. Um, how does this um, impact uh, workplace safety? Yeah, so if we think about the, the mental load, this is the additional duties that women take on. So think of it like, a, say, a, a woman in the home. So she's got a family. It tends to be that people in the family will do specific jobs and, and duties, you know, washing, cleaning, ironing. But the person that project manages that is typically the woman at home. So yes, you know, the, the husband, the partner may do these jobs, but normally if the woman reminds them of it. And if we translate that to the workplace, similar kind of things happen. So when you've got a mix of men and women in meetings, in project groups, it typically is that woman that's taking on this project manager role subconsciously by remembering to do everything. So that's what we mean by the mental load, are women taking on additional burdens that they don't have to. And then the unpaid shift sort of adds to that. So this is where we're thinking about all those extra jobs that women tend to do. They tend to be the carers at home, helping children, elderly relatives. They may do extra cleaning jobs at home. So if they're a cleaner at work, this unpaid shift is an extra bit of cleaning that they're having to do. And again, we need to think about this impact that that has on, on women at work. So I'd love to hear from everybody else. What are your thoughts on this? Is this a thing or um, is this a perception? Well, I can say, go ahead. Yeah, I'll speak to <laughs> oh, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it's really important uh, for the listeners to understand that we are not stereotyping. This is where we're not talking stereotypes. We're talking, this is based on research. And in fact, if you, if you look at, let's, let's talk about the unpaid shift or unpaid labor for a moment. You know, um, there was a really interesting article in, I believe it was the Globe and Mail. And it was, it was research based on last year's statistics. And I just want to make sure I get these numbers correct. So last year, if, if in the United States, women had been paid and that they, um, the, 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 um, study or the, the, the statistics are based on women's work. Okay, so unpaid labor at minimum wage, women would have earned $1.5 trillion last year and globally $10.9 trillion. And that was a study by Oxfam. Right. So it's a big economic win in a sense mm -hmm. for society. And in fact, in 1975, on October 24th, 90% of the women in Iceland went on strike and they call it Long Friday. And according to the research, it literally brought the economy to a standstill and led to the government passing a bill that would allow equality in terms of um, wages for men and women. And they have one of the highest rates of women in the labor force of any country as a result of that. So is it a thing? Absolutely. Is it a perception? Uh, no, no, it's not a perception. Is it a problem? 
for sure. But one of the things that um, Donna just mentioned was that women take on this project management role. And so one of the questions I think we need to ask today is why? And right is question. that necessary? And is it helpful? Because sometimes we are our own worst enemies. I mean, are we programmed maybe to, to take that load on? Because right. like historically, right, we were um, looking after the house, looking after the children, looking after the rest of the community in some way. And so that kind of loads us up in our minds to say, well, we can multitask and we can do a lot. Right. And we still get everything done. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think of those gender roles as well that have been fostered over time and all those cultures that we've been subjected to, it is, you know, women are the caregivers. They are the ones that are the emotional ones that nurture and look after things. You know, women have children. It's, it's sort of genetically bred into them to look after their offspring and they extend this looking after position to everybody else. So I do think you're absolutely right. Are we our own worst enemies at time by doing this? Yeah, and, and that's a really good point to call in a male ally, because you know what, we need to be instrumental in rebalancing that. Let, let's assume we can't do what the women of Iceland did half a century ago. And yeah. they went for one day on strike. And right now, today, in Iceland, there has been a rebalancing of male and female roles, both at work and at home. And so the sharing of that mental load and unpaid shift that Donna refers to has been balanced in Iceland. And you want to go and do one of the GDP studies in Iceland around happiness. And they come out in the top five every year as having gross domestic happiness, higher wow. scores than most other developed countries. It's absolutely mind blowing. And I do think, um, Tamara said, it is, are we uh, our own worst enemies as women? population at work and um, I think so but as long as you you unpick that a little bit and, and realize that you are probably genetically programmed to be the caregivers the homemakers the hunter gatherer the feeder sorry the gatherer not the hunter the guys have gone out broadly speaking and done the hunting the women are there at home nurturing children nurturing elders keeping the homestead safe in in every definition of the word safe and we've now translated that into the 21st century workplace. Are there enough seats in the meeting room? Probably a woman is going to drag a chair in from another meeting room. Has everybody got a cup of tea or coffee before they sit down for the meeting? Probably the lady is going to organise that. But somebody needs to take notes so that we can care for the meeting. Probably it's going to be one of the women in the room. And, and here is a male ally. Let me instantly say, gents who are listening in, on this first in this series of podcasts, you need to back up the women in the room. And when a woman comes in with a notepad and a pen, you tell her to sit on it because why should she be the default note taker? In, in fact, what I do as, as, a, as a mentor to, to both male and female um, direct reports is suggest to them while they're establishing their seniority in an organization, don't take a pen and notepad into the room. Do not take your MacBook into the room because you're powerful and the other people in the room will see your power because you are not going to be the default note taker. Um, you then have scored some, some ladder rung points in seniority just because of your presence in the room. And it's our job as men to support women who do have this strong feminine caring trait to recognise when to engage it and when to disengage it, because it's really valuable that the, all of these skills exist in a modern, nearly always masculine organisational culture. It's right that we recognise these feminine traits, but we must recognise the weakness that comes with it is that you go home and you do another six, eight, ten hours of manual handling activity, handling chemicals, um, having additional pressures from, from organising the kids and the school report and the shopping list and has your partner taken the trash can out and all, all of those things that actually 
we ought to be able to do as a, as a, as a duo in a household or, or across the whole of the family. Let's give some responsibilities to the kids so that they see there is a balance between male and female. And I mean, I, I also want to, to bring a point up that in my career, Lorenzo, unfortunately, I have been out and out told by men that my role is to clean up after the meetings. My role is to do the dishes in the, in the shared kitchen. So it's also reinforced by the men in power and what they're saying to us. And we're, we're employed, right? It's not like you can turn around and say, well, wait a minute, I, I'm not the housekeeper here. You know, um, that, that shouldn't be falling on a woman. So there, you know, the population, like the men have an ownership too to stop and think, um, as you were saying about just defaulting to the women on certain tasks. If, you, if you're in a meeting and you see dishes, pick them up, like be, be part of a team, you know? And Absolutely kind of, so, right. Yeah. And, and that, that's why, I hope that's why Don, Donna asked me to join this panel because you have got to find the male allies in your organization and, and you've got to harness them to work to your benefit. And because this, this is not imagined, this is absolutely real. And, and Tamara picks on the, well, what do I say when I get told to do the dishes or I get told to do the, the, the coffee order? Well, you know what? This, this is fight or flight. This is a stress reaction in, in process right now. And I have the choices to fight my line manager, punch him and say, make your own coffee, which is not going to be <laughs> career enhancing or walk out in protest which is not going to be career enhancing. So we do neither of those. And this doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. We do neither of those things in the modern workplace. Well, that is our normal stress reaction to a, to a, to a stressor, to the pressure. And we're not dissipating that. Well, our, our body released the cortisol to make us have a fight or a flea reaction. We haven't done it. Where's that cortisol gone? It's still circulating in our bodies affecting us mentally, physically, psychologically, yeah. increasing the amount of heart disease. It's staggering how we just innocently go, oh yeah, okay, I'm not gonna dissipate the cortisol in my body and I'm just gonna do whatever I have to do. And um, well, actually this is perpetuating stress in, in the modern world. So guys, if you're not already an ally of these, these issues, you really, really need to switch on because we are hugely disadvantaging up to 50% of the workforce just because of their biological sex. That's wild, wild in modern health and safety occupational practice. But then, you know, I want to move this into looking at, um, so, so what is that impact for also people's safety in the workplace? Yeah. You know, because this, they're going to be distracted. Right. Um, I would love to speak to that because this is an area that I am very passionate and concerned about. Um, so, you know, just, just jumping off of what Lorenzo was saying, when we are in that fight or flight response, and, it, and it's not just in the moment. So in the moment when you're distressed by, you know, somebody asking you to clean up the dishes, or you notice that the room is empty and the dishes are all left behind for you as, a, as the woman in the room. Um, it's not just the aggravation, frustration, irritation in the moment, but it's the resentment that you carry with you through the day. And the problem with the stress response is that particularly when it becomes, when the stresses become chronic, that's when we see the development of all these really nasty health conditions. But in the moment at work, what happens to us in the stress response is that the frontal lobe, this part of the brain that helps us troubleshoot, cooperate, be creative, problem solve, find solutions, manage our time and be organized, goes offline because the blood flow is going to the primitive brain, where as we, you know, Lorenzo said, you want to just run and flee. You want to just escape or you want to fight somebody. And because you don't, can't do either and the cortisol level increases, we are living in those hormones of 
destruction and that frontal lobe isn't operating now you are at work and you cannot problem solve you cannot troubleshoot you can't make a decision you can't follow multiple step instructions because that part of your brain is literally dormant for the moment because you are in that fight or flight response now okay so you can say well that that's a very personal response how does that affect everyone else well think about that i my frontal lobe is offline tamara you and i are working together or side by side do you really want to work with me now add into that not just what happened at work this morning in the boardroom or in the meeting but i've got financial worries i've got my mother in a nursing home who i can't visit and she is calling every day crying about how lonely she is and i've got a teenage daughter or son who i'm having constant conflict with and my low back is killing me what a load for someone and so if, you know, employers can say, managers can say, well, listen, you know, I have no control over all those things. I can't help that person. But if we don't recognize that in North America, work is the number one stressor that people report, work and finances, which are usually linked, are the number one stressors that we report, does it make sense for you as a manager, employer, business owner, to try to not only do no harm, don't add stress, mm. but can we actually mitigate in some way and give people one less thing on their plate and then try to support them in dealing with all of the other things that they've got going on in their life? No, it's not your responsibility to, to say, okay, well, now I, I have to help them with everything, but can we at least be open to the idea that we can sure make a difference as an employer, manager, business owner. Can I get a hallelujah? Oh, Sylvia, at, at least an amen in there, because <laughs> at the very, very least, if you listen to 50% of what you've just said, you've just become the employer of choice. Yes. Because yes. You know what? My employer listened when I said I had nursing home transfer issues and I needed a morning just to make telephone calls. I'm not even leaving the workplace. I just need a little bit of time to cope with those pressures outside of work. And what what employer is going to use the 1960s mantra of, oh, you leave all those things at the door when you come in. I'm only right. responsible for what happens inside the, the boundaries of the workplace. And this, You know, managers, listen to yourself. You know that's not true. In this year of all years, you know that's not true. You've sent your non-essential workers there at home. They're responding to the stay-at-home order in, in their state. And what have you done about their computer workstation? You've said to them, oh, we'll get you a chair. Oh, we'll get you a different screen size. Oh, we'll get you a riser. Oh, we'll get you a keyboard that's uh, wireless. Oh, we'll do all of these things to do something to make your physical home environment because I forced a computer workstation on your home. We will do it. We will stretch out into your home. We will look after you when you're at home. So why won't you look after me when I'm doing my unpaid cleaning shift and, and help me with whatever sort of chemicals I need um, or at least ask me about the chemicals I'm using at home because I could be bringing in, I don't know, surface level of, of, of cleaners on my hands or ask me about the, the physical care I'm giving to grandma because I'm doing patient handling in my work, my paid work, and I, I'm doing grandma handling because she's bedridden when I get home. You already do it when you're making reasonable adjustments for Americans with disability. So mm -hmm. why aren't you making reasonable adjustments for, oh, just your workers? I, and I Oh, I'd like to pop in here, Lorenzo, and also get Donna into the mix. Donna, we have a question from Rosa Carrillo, and, and she's asking, haven't women adapted to these roles and learned how to function in spite of the psychological stressors? I think that's a great question. And I think we've been forced to adapt. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. Um, so yes, we, we do take on this extra burden. We do do these unpaid shifts but we shouldn't really be doing it. And I think we've adapted and we've adapted at the expense of our own health. 
and our own well-being and, and that's the critical issue here it's the impact that this is having on us at work and I think just to bring out some of the points that Sylvia and Lorenzo have have just talked about you know we have to recognize that when we think about the stress and the research does show this women will have higher levels of stress when they leave work it's a fact you know our stress takes longer to to come down than that of a man so we're increasing all this stress for women at work and through this unpaid shift and this mental load and they're still taking it back home with them so yes we are adapting and things are getting more complicated but it's not doing our health any good and, and we're having more health effects as a result of this burden that we're taking on. And the world's complicated now. The world has changed. You know, we do have more women in the workplace. And I think leaders need to recognise that. They need to recognise that responsibilities for risk assessment extend further than the workplace because there's all this other stuff that we need to factor in into how that's affecting women at work. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you mentioned risk assessment, Donna, because... Um, we have for a long, long time decided that for uh, equal rights, gender neutrality is a really good idea in risk assessment. So the risk of exposure by a man or by a woman is identical. And you've just pointed to the research that says women's stress experience is dissipated slower than a man. So, so mm -hmm. is taken home and then you recharge it with all of your home activities. So now is the time for us to stop thinking that gender neutrality is actually beneficial and we should be gender sensitive in the way we approach hazards in, in the workplace. And, and then once we've beaten that one, we can look at extending our responsibilities as, as managers into looking after workers outside of work. But yeah. right yeah. now, we do need to recognise women experience stress in a different way. Their coping mechanisms are different and their length of experience is different. So we, we need to move to gender sensitive risk assessment really, really quickly. And you wanna see some evidence for this? Go into your organization and count the number of senior women. Look at the C-suite women in your organization today. And even if you're in a traditional female dominated workforce, education or nursing, the top 10% are guys. How's that right when they only represent 10% of the overall workforce? At least yeah. that's yeah. the statistics of nursing in the UK. Men only make up 10% of the nursing workforce, but they are uh, in the top 10% of management. Well, so and maybe the question is, is that um, socially, the viewpoint is the, that that's the image for management is the male. And the female is not the image yet for management. Maybe that's a discussion to have also, how we perceive management. And, and I think I as well, right. it's, 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 it's not just the perception. If, if it is the fact that we've got more men in this C-suite position, is that why we're not getting the change that we need? Because is it the male that doesn't recognise this additional mental load, this unpaid shift and the impact this has on women at work? If, if the C-suite is top heavy through men, we're never going to get the change that we need for the women in the workforce. And what I'm trying to share is just to clarify, because I don't think I was very clear on my thoughts then, is when they're hiring for those C-suite levels, it seems there's a pattern of going towards a male who is white. Yeah. I also see that there's not much diversity in racial diversity up in those C-suites. So when I look at a conference and I see a whole bunch of white men are the, are the main speakers, or I go to a company and I see all white men as the executive board, but yet you know that in their demographic of workers, they have people from different races, that's also a conversation that needs to be broken out, right? If we're truly for inclusion and diversity and understanding the mental loads that people come to work with, thoughts? Yeah. Oh, you are absolutely right, Tamara. And now we've, we've spoken very um, superficially about the different stress experience based on, on your sex. Well, you need to start looking at the black American um, but a minority ethnic stress experience, it is also disproportionately bad compared to that white male stress experience. But, but I guess as a social animal, 
we tend to recreate things um, in, in our own image. So if you start with a couple of white guys in, in the C-suite, they are more likely to hire a, a white guy, I guess. Um, so again, we're back to this whole idea of male allies for this subject area. There needs to be somebody who is really, really trumpeting the benefits of having senior women in an organization. And those organizations who have got balanced gender boards have better success. So we need to see more of those examples so that it, it, it begins to gain some, some traction. And then I think we can start talking about gender sensitivity in, in safety management. And I don't think it's even um, noticed. Like, I don't think it's done on purpose because I, I remember one company I was at, the CEO um, had a diversity meeting, right? A bunch of us come together to talk to him about, you know, how it can increase diversity in the company in different positions. And I remember he was sitting there and he was very proud of himself that, oh, we're doing really well. We have so many people of, you know, uh, different backgrounds and everything in our company, et cetera. And, and I said, <laughs> as I looked at and I said, you think we're doing really well? And he's like, oh yeah. And I was like, okay, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of challenge this thought. If you look at your executive team, how many people from this table here look around the table and how many of the people on your executive team represents the diversity of the people sitting at this table? And we had all colors in there, all races, everything. And he just looked at them and his jaw, he just went whiter than white. And he's like, okay, we're not doing well. And for the first time in my life, I saw a CEO look ashamed. And then when he went out of there, he just ripped apart and started looking at exactly who he was hiring. And we saw a totally different stream of executives starting to come through that door. You know, it was the first time in my whole life I actually had a, um, a male who was from India being a senior VP of marketing as my, my, my executive director. I was like, hallelujah, finally, somebody has opened the gate. So, you know, that was a moving moment to actually see that transition happen in a company. And, and what advocates for women's safety need to really do is find how you achieve that, how you get that light bulb moment. Um, and it, it can start site by site. We, we don't need some enormous organizational cultural overhaul here. This is about getting your line manager and your line manager's manager to realize that there is effectively discrimination of predominantly women because of the unpaid shift at home um, who are coming back into the workplace the next day, tired and distracted, with higher potential for incident. Uh, and until we can get a department, two departments, a function, a site, an organization thinking this way, um, we, we are not gonna have a revolution here. It, uh, Iceland pulled it off, but I think Iceland is the only example in 50 years where women just said no more and they didn't cook and they didn't clean and they didn't wash the kids one day. Yeah. One day. Yeah. And you know, was there is some, some interesting research, um, just to hop on what you said, Lorenzo, that Sweden, Norway, and Denmark have the um, lowest gap between male and female unpaid labor. And that's because they have social programs for elder care and child care and lots of other things. So they have the the smallest gap, whereas in the United States last year, women on average put in, and this is an average, so you can imagine there would be some pretty extreme numbers here, but on average, four hours a day after their paid shift, whereas males, two and a half hours a day. But that gap is, that's not, that's not as bad as what I would have expected it to be. So that I think things are, the, the gap is narrowing, um, but it is a, it's a multi-layered issue with ripple effects at every single level. And some of it is, you know, getting back to what I said at the beginning, it's in some ways, and I say this with so much love and respect, and I say this very gently, not with the intention to offend, mm -hmm. but we have to ask ourselves, 
what are we doing to contribute to this? Now, I'm a control freak when it comes to certain things in my home. I like to do the cooking because I am a gourmet cook, right? So I take that on because I choose to take that on. So I can't come home from a long day at work and be frustrated and angry that I have to cook the meal. I've chosen that because I prefer my cooking and I, I'm a health fanatic, you know, my cooking is so, you know, there are certain things that we just have to look at and say, you know, is there a way to do it better? There was a really funny cartoon series of cartoons that I looked at when I was prepping for this and the caption for every cartoon was you should have asked. And it was the man saying this to the woman who was completely frazzled, looking after kids, cooking something on the stove, trying to welcome guests into the home, you know, having a load of laundry going while she's cooking something on the stove and trying to feed the children and getting the, right? And, and being frustrated and angry. And I'm not trying to simplify this and say, this is all because women aren't asking, but there is an aspect or an element to this. And we have the opportunity to help ourselves, but also to help our, our partners mm-hmm. and also to help our male and female children. You know, and I think it was, it was you, Lorenzo, that talked about this, getting the whole family involved in things, you know, can we, can we share, can we share everything? Can we share the outdoor work? Can we share car maintenance? Can we share meal preparation? Can we share laundry? I'll, I'll do the laundry do the laundry you fold the laundry or whatever that is and and you know can we can we bring that same approach to work women get frustrated because we sometimes feel like people should just know what needs to be done can we just let that perception and expectation go for a minute and just ask can you please do this I think you've made a really good point there. And I just want to pick up on this. Uh, yeah. You should have just asked comment. And I think that yeah. smacks of this mental load problem that we've got. And, and at the start of this podcast, that's exactly what I was saying about this. You know, women are the project manager, because yeah. I think in most cases, the, the children, the, the partners, the husbands, they all want to help. But you've got to remind them. So we're taking on this extra burden, this extra mental load, because we have to say things like, have you done the washing up or do you mind doing the washing up? Could you just go and pop out and get the shopping? And and that's carrying on into the workplace. And I think this is where this problem stems from, because I'm sure in the workplace, if we did say those things and say, could you do this? Could you do that? They would. But why are we having that mental burden, that mental load of having to project manage everything? It's, it's that, I think, which is the, the key here in causing the stress. And when I, I oh, oh, sorry, sorry, go I, ahead, Lorenzo. Go ahead. I was just, was gonna, just say, gonna say, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right, I am absolutely gonna be quiet. It is over to you, Sylvia. No, I was just gonna say, you're, you know, that's true, Donna. The question I have is, If you don't, there's this balance, right? If you don't ask, can you help? Do we then just live with the resentment of having to do it all versus maybe being able to role model or even create the the habit where after three or four times of asking or five or six or eight times of asking, hey, can you do this? Will it become something that someone then observes and picks yeah. up, whether that's in the workplace or, or maybe it's, it's even more structured. It's a negotiation. It's a conversation where everyone sits down and says, listen, I, I don't want to do this all, all the time anymore. Who's willing to pick up this, this, this? And so the project management happens maybe at the negotiation conversation or meeting, and then maybe it doesn't need to happen again, or maybe then it just needs to be a reminder. Because I feel like on the one hand, the, the project management is a mental load, but on the other hand, if we, if we, um, take that, take our natural ability to project manage 
and try to find a way to negotiate something that works for everyone, whether it's in our family or our team at work, would that not be worth that extra, maybe stress of project managing in the yeah. short term? Because we're really good at it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, right? and, and, and take that negotiation pain now to reap the benefits long term. Absolutely. I think we've got to start somewhere. Yes, but we have to speak up because swallowing it, you know, I always say our issues live in our tissues. Swallowing that resentment mm. spills over everywhere. everywhere. It spills yeah. over at work. It spills over at home where we are silently slamming the cupboard door because there's no one in the kitchen helping us clean up. Why? They should know better. And I, yeah. darn it, I'm not asking. I don't need to ask someone to come and help me clean up the dishes. They should know better. So yeah. we see and no one's aware and we had a question actually from one of the comments on LinkedIn, Virgil, who was saying, isn't that part of the management's role in order to be the champions also in the workplace of setting the culture of what the expectations are? We talk a lot about culture setting, right? So mm. where does that come into play? I think exactly where Sylvia is right now yeah. in the we, we'll take a little bit of extra pain. Let's put that to the side for one minute, but just look at the, what that is to do some standard setting, to develop a policy. I, I know we were doing negotiating in the home about sharing chores, but let's just transition that into the workplace. Let, let's have a focus group of representative groups from work. Let's set a policy. Let's do the training that's needed to achieve that policy. And absolutely right, we are changing the behaviors, the things you can see in a workplace. And if you can collect all of those observable acts together, I, I put forward that's a definition of the culture of that workplace, the observable acts in the workplace. Um, so I, I think it's exactly the role of management to do that project management and establish where the risks are. And, and what I was going to do when I was, I was trying to chip in a little earlier as, as your male ally is kind of convert the, you should have asked to, which is very, um, oriented around the woman yet again, taking the active role in dissipating her health and safety risk to you should have known, which is what the guy should do, you should have seen. And, yeah. and we're really good yeah. at that because we train our workers, irrespective of their sex, we train them in hazard analysis, safety observations, uh, quality control. We have all sorts of go and see and solve uh, trainings in, in a workplace. So why can't we focus on retraining that person who isn't having that mental load, who isn't having that unpaid shift into seeing those things and preempting the, could you take the trash out please, to I have taken the trash out. Now you'd need to be sitting down before he said that to you because that would just come from way out of the field. <laughs> In, in, the, in the transitioning into the workplace, absolutely, we have skills and we have, we have invested money in training people to spot hazards. So let's not switch off our hazard spotting skills and absolutely. use them at home and in the workplace, mm -hmm. but let's stop spotting machinery guarding fails. No, please don't stop, but let's move your focus from not only spotting machinery guarding fails or, or PPE non-conformance let's start spotting hey why did we leave jane to do this or do that in the meeting room why was the canteen table cleared by helen um it's just odd if you worked in an all male environment one of the guys would have done it right <laughs> exactly and i just want to pop in here because we also we're coming to the end of our time but we have another question um or statement from uh fumi and she's saying, um, is, it, is it possible for one to really want to help if it has been asked for or has to be asked for or reminded? I don't think it is help anymore when you have to ask for it. So what about her perspective on that? What are people's thoughts? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think if, you, if you're constantly having to ask the other person to do something, then that just becomes a pain. And then in the end, you end up doing it yourself because you don't want the burden of having to ask. You don't want that uh, negative reaction that you're gonna get back. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. But I think again, echoing Sylvia's point, we have to start somewhere with this negotiation process 
and then hopefully that builds into never having to ask again because those things are just done right right okay people last thoughts we've got just a few more minutes so why don't we start with you donna and share what would you like to leave with our, our audience with today to think about I think for me, I think I'd like the audience to think about this shift that we've got in the workplace now. We have more women at work. We're moving away from this heavy industry, traditional safety risk environment where we've got all these nuanced hazards and issues with psychological safety and emotional safety, especially for women. And I think my, my pledge and my call out is to all those health and safety professionals out there to say, really, is your risk assessment process right? Are we really thinking in terms of diversity? Are we really thinking in terms of being sensitive to the different biological sexes and what they need? And let's start considering that the, the stress, the load, the unpaid shift, it all extends wider than the workplace. And we need to think about the impact that has on people at work. Sylvia, go next. What are your thoughts? All right. So I have so many thoughts and I, I really wanted this to be a three hour visit this morning because there's so much to talk about. But I want to say this to employers and managers. I just want to reiterate a point that I made earlier, which is why is this your business? Why should you care about these things? What we know is that in Canada, Stress leaves have been costing over $50 billion a year. We think that's a really gross underestimation of the problem. We know that workplace stress is the number one stressor that Canadians report. It's really no different in the US. We're pretty much the same um, on these statistics. So when we look at that and we look at the effect of loss of productivity, presenteeism, um, time loss, uh, and, it, and it could be for lots of different reasons. People who are stressed out are also more at risk for incidents and accidents at work. When we look at those things and we look at what are the medication usages in your, that, you know, that are coming through your um, insurance programs, like think about the long-term effect, the long-term cost to a company when you do nothing to assist your employees in managing the stress that they experience every day. When we talk about the unpaid shift, the research shows that there's a disproportionate amount of stress on when typically it's women. And again, not stereotyping. We are, we are talking about research. Can you as the employer, manager, supervisor, the company owner, understand that you have the right, the privilege, and the responsibility to do what you can to help and not harm the women, especially in your organization. Because when we are, when we are free to work to our potential, we will blow your mind. Lorenzo, wrap it up. I, I, I have very little to add to what Donna and Sylvia has said, except if, if you're a manager or you're a safety professional today, go and take one of those blockages away that's stopping you from realizing the uh, action to do something positive, to, to live what Donna or Sylvia have just said. You know, go and ask one of your coworkers how yesterday was. And you don't mean yesterday's shift in your organization. You mean what happened from end of shift until they came back in today. And if they say they've got a problem, why don't you do something about that problem? If, if they came and reported a temporary or a permanent disability to you, you would do something to make a reasonable adjustment. So why don't you just make a reasonable adjustment? Do you know what? Do the right thing is a value that can help us on this road. Let's just do the right thing today. So this is a great conversation. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming and joining us. This is our first kickoff of Women in Safety Morning Show. So I'm thrilled that it was so dynamic and um, you know really got some energy and great topics going. I want to just kind of um, 
call out to everybody who's listening to follow up on what all our guests are saying, you know, look at for that one small thing that you might be able to do that cannot kind of help lift the load off of other people around you. That's my action plan for you today. If you can just kind of share in the comments later, what kind of things can we help one another with in order to relieve some of that mental load and unpaid shift that so many people at our workplaces might be um, struggling with. So thank you everybody for joining. That was great. Thank you, Donna. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you everybody. Thank you.